Let's go ahead and open our Bibles today to the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 21, verse number 28 is our starting point. This is where we left off yesterday. The chronological information we need to know is this. It is the 12th day of the first Jewish month. Uh, on our calendar, uh, we're talking about it being uh, a Wednesday, which would be equivalent to our 1st of April in A.D. 33. We're only just a couple of days from Jesus becoming the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Jesus is having confrontations with the leadership at Jerusalem as he comes to the temple complex each day of this week. Uh, most recently, they said to him, how dare you? By what authority are you doing these things? Like casting the money changers and the, uh, and the people that were fleecing the sheep uh, by the selling of sheep. Uh, they wanted to know, what gives you the right to do that? And his response was interesting. He says, I tell you what, I'll answer that if you'll answer me this. By what authority was John's ministry done? Meaning John the Immerser. Did it come from heaven, that is from God, or did it come from men? And the leadership immediately started deliberating about how to answer this. And they came to the conclusion that if they said, well, it was from God, then Jesus' response would be, then why weren't you repenting and being immersed? Why didn't you accept his message? Because they didn't. But if they were to go the opposite way, the way that they actually believed and said, it wasn't from God, it was from a human being, then it was possible that the crowds would want to stone them because they were convinced that John the Immerser was a great prophet, which of course he was. And so they said, we can't be certain. We can't know for sure. And Jesus said, well, then I'm not going to answer your question about my authority. I mean, if they couldn't accept the authority of God in John the Immerser's life, why would they accept Jesus' authority being from God? which prompts Jesus to launch into some parables. Remember, parables are illustrations true to life, but which have some significant teaching point. And so let's look at Matthew 21, 28. What do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, Son, go and work in the vineyard today. And he answered, I will not. But afterward, he changed his mind and he went. And the man went to the other son and said the same. And he, said, he answered, I'm going to go, sir. But he didn't bother to go. Which of the two did the will of his father? Now, the answer is very obvious, isn't it? They said the first one. You know, he started out rejecting it, but eventually received the will of his father. So Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you didn't believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. So they repented. They had been out of sorts with God. They had, they had said to God, No, I'm not going to do things your way. But then when John comes along and offers the message of God, those people said, we repent. We changed our mind. We want to do the work of God. And they were the ones that were immersed. They were the ones that started fresh in order to be ready for the kingdom. So they were the first son that did the will. But, Jesus goes on, even when you saw it, you did not afterward change your minds and believe him. So the Pharisees and the Sadducees both rejected the ministry calls of John the Immerser that they should repent and do the works of God. And even when they saw people change their lives dramatically, 
the Pharisees and the Sadducees maintained this conviction they had nothing to repent of. They had no reason to change what they were already doing. And so even though they claimed that they were doing what God the Father wanted them to do, they weren't. And so the parable is clearly one intended to sting these gentlemen into repenting still. Because as long as they're breathing, they have a chance to repent. Verse 33, Jesus launches into another parable. Hear another parable. There was a master of a house who planted a vineyard and built a fence around it and dug a wine press in it and built a tower and leased it to tenants and went into another country. Uh, now, this parable you can see in Mark chapter 12, Luke chapter 20. Some of the construction of it seems to come from the book of Isaiah. Uh, the idea that God took a wild olive out of Egypt, excuse me, a wild um, grapevine out of Egypt, meaning the Jewish people, and brought it into the promised land, the fenced garden, and started his own vineyard and cared for it and did wonderful things with it. Uh, so part of it is constructed out of Jewish um, allegory or Jewish teaching already in existence. Uh, but Jesus expands on it. He basically says that the man who owned the vineyard, in this case it's God, he leased it out to tenants who were supposed to take care of it and then give him his part of the proceeds of each year's harvest. And so this is a representation of those in leadership in Israel over the Jewish people. Particularly, we're talking about the spiritual leadership. They were supposed to be giving to God more people every year that would belong to him. That was the idea of the vineyard of Israel. Now, verse 34 of our Matthew 21 account. When the season for fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the tenants to get his fruit. And the tenants took his servants and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants more than the first, and they did the same to them. Uh, so this is being representative of what happened over the centuries of Israel's history that when God saw that there should be people coming into his relationship there in Israel, he sent prophets in order to harvest those people into his kingdom. And what happens? Those prophets get mistreated by the religious leadership. Some of them are even killed, which we know historically is true. The prophets uh, were often horribly mistreated and rejected and killed. Verse number 37. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. So you can see exactly where this is going now. After all these centuries of God sending prophets, he then says, I'll send my own beloved son Maybe they'll listen to him. They'll respect him and give me what I want, which is fruit out of my vineyard. People saved out of the vineyard of Israel. Verse 38. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and have his inheritance. And so that's exactly where the, the leadership of Israel is at this moment in our story. They hate Jesus so much that they are talking about killing him because they think then that they can keep the vineyard to themselves. They can keep control of everything the way they want it done. And so this is what they will do with him. 
They took him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. And uh, the, the parallelism here is the idea that the vineyard could even be um, narrowed down to Jerusalem itself. Because Jesus will be crucified outside the walls of Jerusalem. So he will be thrown outside the vineyard and killed there. Verse 40, Jesus asks a question. When therefore the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to these tenants? Now keep in mind that as Jesus tells this story, uh, he's got a mixed group around him. Uh, He's got uh, his apostles, he's got uh, his disciples, he's got those that may have only been in his presence for the very first time uh, during this Passover uh, visit to Jerusalem, and uh, then he's got the Pharisees and the Sadducees that hate him. So Jesus throws this, um, this question out, and it gets answered by the people that were caught up in it. They can't believe how unfair this story is, that that these tenant farmers would murder not just the, the servants of this person that owns the vineyard, but also murder the son of the man who owns this vineyard. And so they answer, verse 41, they said, to him, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and let out the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the fruit in their seasons. That's what he'll do. And so that's what the people hearing it say should be fair. Now, in Luke's account, and I want you to turn there, Luke 20, verse number 16, uh, we have what the people said, and Jesus agreed with them. He's, he basically says, you're right. He will come and destroy those tenants and give the vineyard to others. When they heard this, they said, Surely not. Now, the literal language there at the end of verse 16 is, may it not be so. Uh, This is what the Pharisees and the Sadducees said. They did not like the way this story was going. They did not think that the tenant farmers, clearly them, should have anything untoward done to them. Luke's gospel goes on. Since we're there, let's continue. He looked directly at them and said, so Jesus makes eye contact with these guys that don't like the parable that he just told. When then is this, uh, what then is this that is written? And then he quotes from the psalm that has been sung the last couple of days. Uh, It apparently is a favorite song to be sung every day as the uh, pilgrims go in and out of Jerusalem and go in and out of the temple. That's Psalm 118. So he quotes from Psalm 118, The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Now, I told you when we first started this week of Passover that This was one of those fun things uh, that uh, the Jewish people like to laugh over. Uh, And it is a traditional story. It clearly is attested to by this psalm that when they were building the temple under Solomon, that everything was done modular. It was all snapped together off-site first and fitted and trimmed and made sure that it fit properly and then dissembled, marked, and Each stone, each timber was taken up to the Temple Mount and then put together according to the plan. Well, as they came to the last day, when they should have been able to put the final stone in place, the capping stone, the the top stone, they couldn't find it. It was nowhere to be found. So they started searching the Temple Mount. And finally, out in the weeds, uh, they found this rock that people had thrown off to the side and had been stumbling over and calling it all sorts of names. And lo and behold, it was the most important stone in the whole building. And so they laughed about it, 
and sang about it later. The stone which the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, the most important stone in the building. Well, Jesus, he picks up on that and says, that's what you guys are doing to me. You guys want to kill me even though I'm the son of the vineyard owner and you're just the tenant farmers and you haven't been doing your job. And God's been sending his prophets through the centuries to you, and you've been killing them off right one after another. And now you're going to kill me off. But it ain't going to happen. It's not going to end that way. Because, and here's uh, the rest of uh, the Luke 20, starting at verse 18 passage, which still continues in Psalm 118, by the way. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces, And when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. That stone is going to win in the end. Do you remember in the book of Daniel, the prophetic vision of this statue that is demolished by this stone that comes up being cut out of the mountain without human hands? And it comes down and it crushes this statue that represents all these different kingdoms uh, that thought they were in control. And then that stone grows up and becomes the greatest kingdom of all. And it's clearly a reference to the Messianic kingdom, the kingdom of Jesus Christ, the eternal kingdom. Well, here is Jesus warning these guys, you will not come out of this well if you continue to reject who I am. This stone will take you down, even though you reject it. Uh, Now, with that in mind, let's pop back to the Matthew passage, because uh, Jesus does give uh, wording along that line that I was just talking about. Matthew 21, 43. Well, let's read... um, Let's read 42 again. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? That was the Lord's doing. It's marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you. That is, away from you Pharisees and Sadducees. Away from you unbelieving members of the council. You supposed to be leaders of Israel. It's going to be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruits. So it's going to be given to people who have repented and want to give God his due. That is, give them, give him themselves, give him other people that are repentant and coming to him. They want to honor him as the true owner of the vineyard. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived that he was speaking about them. Well, duh, how hard is that to figure out? Uh, If for no other reason, he was looking straight in their eyes when he said those last bits. Verse 46, and although they were seeking to arrest him, they feared the crowds because they held him to be a prophet. So these guys are scared to move on Jesus, even though they feel they must move on Jesus. And this will come into their council decision uh, that we'll read about soon in that when they meet, They'll say, we need to arrest him, but let's not do it during what remains of the Passover, lest we end up with a riot. Let's wait until it's all over with and then arrest him. So that was their plan, time-wise. But Judas Iscariot's decision to betray Jesus will change that plan. Matthew 22. Jesus is not yet done with parables. Again, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. 
and sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. We've actually seen this parable before in another context. But I've told you before, preachers reuse material because repetition helps in retention, in education. So he tells the story of a father, who is clearly God the Father, who wants to put on a wedding feast for his son, who is Jesus. And the wedding feast, of course, is the inauguration of Jesus as the king, because he's taking as his bride his church. Uh, Old Testament, New Testament, both describe God's people as the bride. Verse number four. Again, he sent other servants saying, tell those who were invited, see, I've prepared my dinner, my oxen, my fat calves have been slaughtered, everything's ready, come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully, and killed them. So basically, this is the leadership that we've been talking about, rejecting the call of the king, God king, to come to the wedding feast of Jesus the Son, to accept him as the one who was, is, and will always be. And not only do they reject it for themselves, they actually interfere in the message being continually preached to others. They they mistreat, even kill the messengers. Uh, remember in the previous parable, uh, that was a reference to the prophets being killed through the years. Verse 7, the king was angry. No surprise there. And he sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. That's God's justice and judgment. Then he said to his servants, the wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go, therefore, to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. So the wedding feast invitation is now being expanded to everyone. Uh, Part of this is about the invitation to the non-Jews to embrace Messiah, something part of God's plan all along. Uh, but something very exciting uh, in church history. And by the way, Matthew in his gospel makes a big deal out of the commission of the gospel going to all the nations. Verse 10, those servants went out into all the roads, gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. Uh, That's bad and good as in uh, acceptable or not acceptable by common standards. So that's a reference to Uh, like the poor and uh, the people who had physical ailments, which the Pharisees figured was part of their fate, and so they weren't really interested in them. Uh, But Jesus sees them as future subjects in his kingdom. So he gathered all those they found, both good and bad, so the wedding hall was filled with guests. So in the end, Jesus has his wedding feast. But then, one final warning about genuine relationship. When the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. Now, this surprises us, but it was part of their culture, especially if you were wealthy, that you would include as part of the invitation the wedding garments to wear when you came to the feast. So you didn't come in your own clothing. You came in the clothing provided by the one that invited you. And I think this is representative of the fact that our salvation is being covered by Jesus. We put him on as our new clothing whenever we accept him as Messiah. So he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? So he can tell right away he's a wedding party crasher. And he was speechless because he's not dressed in the proper attire. This is a representation of thinking that you can get into 
the kingdom of God without wearing Jesus, without being covered by his blood, covered by his salvation. Uh, Then the king said to the attendants, bind him hand and foot, cast him into the outer darkness, you know, outside our uh, kingdom. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth for many are called, but few are chosen. Now, how do you get chosen? Answer the call. Put on the robes. Accept the salvation that is in Jesus Christ. Have a great weekend. See you next week, Lord willing.